talking about materialism, the idea that our mental life emerges from our physical brain. If you are listening closely, if you are thinking about this, I hope you acknowledge it that this is an odd and natural view. I don't expect you to believe it, at least not at first. And in fact, for the most part, people are far more attracted to the doctrine called dualism. Dualism is an idea that's been found in just about every religion and every philosophy. It's made explicit in Plato, for instance. But I think the most thoughtful and articulate defender of dualism was the philosopher René Descartes. Descartes believed that animals were material things. He thought that the doctrine of materialism was about non-human animals. But humans are different, Descartes argued. For humans, there is a duality. We possess two sorts of things, we are composed of two sorts of things. We are in part material, but we are also in part spiritual, separate, mental, psychological. In some way that doesn't reduce to the material. He made two arguments for this and they both reasonably good arguments, at least quite persuasive at this time and have persuaded many people and continue to persuade many people. The first argument for a non-material nature is that humans are capable of doing things that no machine, no material entity ever could. So it might surprise you to hear this, but Descartes in the 17th century was familiar with robots. He knew about the French royal gardens, which is like a 17th century Disneyland or Euro Disney, which had robots that react when you approach them or when you step on certain stones. For instance, you might approach Diana and the Neptune will jump out from the bushes holding a trident. This was done not, a lo not of electricity, but with water. So Descartes knew about these robots, and Descartes asked, well, maybe we're such things, maybe we're just machines responding to the environment. And he said that we can't be. He said maybe animals, non-human animals can't be. But human behavior is far more complicated and variegated and subtle to be explained in such simple ways. We'll return to this point later on in the chorus when we talk about Noam Chomsky. And Noam Chomsky is critic of behaviorism, which argue that basically humans respond in a relatively reflexive way to environmental stimuli. Descartes, along with Chomsky, said that can be. Our behaviors far too complicated for that, so we can't be machines. His second argument is probably better now and is based on intuition. And his claim was we don't feel like bodies. So, to put it more technically, he applied what was called a method of doubt. He asked the question, what do we know for sure and what can we question? So, for instance, you might believe you were born in such and so place. It could be wrong. It could be deceived. You might believe that the Earth is thousands or millions of years old. But maybe the Earth was created a hundred years ago and all the memories that your grandparents have of the past were just manufactured. You might believe, said Descartes, that you live in a world of things, that you are sitting on a chair, or there's a wall in front of you, or there's a computer near your hands. But Descartes observed that we often believe such things when we are in dreams, but we are mistaken. He observed that people who are mentally ill or were deranged in some way might have such beliefs, but don't be mistaken. So, you could be wrong that there is a physical world around you. It could be wrong that there is a body that you have. This is an antient concern, of course, but it's best articulated in the movie, The Matrix, which maintains that we think we are running around in the physical world, but actually, with the lucky exception of our heroes, like Neo and Trinity, we are actually just plugged into some sort of system. Another version of this is that we are brains in a wet. If you were a brain, just a brain sitting in a wet with electrical wires stimulating your experiences, you couldn't help. Maybe you are such things. Modern day philosophers, for instance, will argue that there is an excellent chance that we are simulations. We are computer simulations. So Descartes and people following Descartes say, there is a lot we can't be sure of. 
The things that we are seemingly most confident about in the real world can be shaken. But, Descartes said, there's one thing you can doubt. You can doubt your own consciousness. You can doubt your own existence. The famous line is, I think, therefore I am. And spelling out this intuition, build it from the fact you could doubt that you have a body, but you can doubt that you have a mind. Descartes wrote, I knew that there was a substance, the whole essence of nature of which is to think, and that for its existence there is no need of any place, nor does it depend in a material thing. That is to say, the soul by which I am, what I am, is entirely distinct from body. So, there's a philosophical case for dualism, but as I said, dualism is also emerged out of common sense. Think about how you describe your body. You describe your body as if you possess it, my arm, my heart, my body, my brain, as if it's something separate from you that you have. Or consider your intuitions about personal identity. So, typically, as people age, their consciousness follows their body. So, I get 10 years older, my mind is 10 years older, my brain is 10 years older. It all connects together, but we easily accept at least the fact that people can hold from one body to another. There are many comedies that involve body switching, body swamps. There are movies that involve somebody going to sleep one morning as one person and waking up as another. We understand they are fiction, they aren't real, but they make sense to us. There is an intuitive rationale to this. We don't walk out of the terror and say, I'm totally confused with heaven there. Rather, at least, with our naive conception of the self, we accept at least of the possibility that you can hope from one body to another. None of this is limited to modern-day movies. The most famous short story of history by Franz Kafka begins with a sentence. As Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed and his bed into a gigantic insect. Metamorphosis involves a transformation in the long before that unilizes the characters are transformed. Some of the characters are transformed by an evil witch into pigs. It's none of you talk to people and turn them into pigs rather it's much worse. They put them in the body of pigs. As the passage goes, they had the head of voice and bristles and body of swine, but their minds remained unchanged as before, so they repent there, weeping. Our conception that bodies and cells are separate allows us to accept the idea you had many people inhabiting one body. This is how many people think about multiple personality disorder. Something we'll get to quite later on the course It's also at the root of a view that many people, both religious and non-religious, hold, which is the idea of demonic position the body can be taken over by somebody else. Which are the immaterial beings that can think, that can absorb, that can act, but they don't have physical bodies in the same sense that we do. Finally, and maybe most important for people, the idea that of dualism, the idea you are not your physical body, raises what must be for many an incredibly appealing consequence, which is that you can survive the destruction of the body. In fact, if you ask most people, religious and non-religious, what will happen after your body is destroyed? The answer is not well. I'm dead then that it is the end of things. But rather, the belief is that you can live on. Maybe you'll end up in some spirit world. Maybe you will ascend to heaven. If you're unlucky, maybe you'll descend to hell. Maybe you'll occupy some other body as in reincarnation. But the idea that the destruction of your body need not to be the destruction of you, because you are not your body. All of these beliefs, the beliefs about personal identity, the beliefs about life after death, about the existence of supernatural beings, about God, all rest, at least to some extent, on a dualist perspective. 
So, materialism, which says dualism just plain wrong is an audacious view and should be treated as such. You shouldn't just shrug and write it down. You should grapple with it. You should worry about it. You should either begrudgingly accept it or fight against it. So, why are modern-day psychologists and nurse scientists so confident that dualism is mistaken? Well, there are a few problems with it. One is that it simply doesn't help us explain certain things that need to be explained. Appealing to a material world to an immaterial soul seems to dock. Certain questions that really do deserve an answer. So, through the discourse we'll ask questions like How do we learn language? What do we find sexually attractive? How does memory work? There's a questions about ourselves, about our minds, to say Oh, it all happens in some immaterial realm. Leaves us hopeless when it comes to answering them. The second concern is that at the time, Descartes was cornered to infer from the limitations of material things, physical things that were probably are not physical things. But by now, we have a much better understanding what physical things can do, which makes it entirely possible for many of us that we are said things. So, I'm thinking, for instance, of computers and robots. For Descartes, the idea that a physical thing can do something as complicated as play a game of chess would seem ludicrous. But now, of course, we know that physical things, and if you're looking at a computer, you're looking at such a physical thing can do that. Which they could recognize objects, they could store things in memory, they can make inferences, and so on. Now, for some of the things, they don't do it anywhere near as well as people do. So, when we talk about language development, for instance, we see that a two-year-old child uses and understands language better than any computer. So, we need to bear that in mind. But still, it's no longer nuts to say that physical things can do all of the rich and psychological endeavors and psychological complicated things that people do. Which means that we have to take seriously the claim that we are in fact such physical things. The final consideration is that there is tremendous evidence that the brain is in fact the roots of mental life. So put aside all the philosophical abstract arguments that are just on direct evidence has always been there. You don't have to be born in the 20th or 21st century to appreciate the getting hit in the head could affect your consciousness and your memory. To appreciate that diseases like syphilis can lead to disruption of the will and of consciousness. Alzheimer can rob you of your rationality. That coffee and alcohol can inflame the passions. It just is so wide and in everyday life that a physical events that affect the brain can affect our cells, suggesting that at the very least our mental life is intimately connected to the brain. Over recent years something else has happened which is we've developed technology that allow us to look directly into the brain. Look at the brain's activations and infer from patterns of the brain activation what people are thinking. So, very cruelly, you can put somebody into a scanner, an fMRI scanner, and you could tell whether or not they're thinking about language, or music, or sex. The technology is increasing. There is such a point that it is not implausible that for some of you, by the time you are listening to this, we can put a sleeping person under a fMRI scanner and know from neural patterns of neural firings, know what they're dreaming. All of this, I think it is very difficult to keep this in mind and hold on to the view of dualism. I think materialism, however uncomfortable, however unpopular, is a view that science forces us to adopt.